Welcome to the Tradies in Business podcast with your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Nicole Cox. Divert your phone and grab a brew as Waz and Nick unpack tips, tales, secrets and stuff-ups from guests both inside and outside your trade, helping educate and inspire you to break the cycle of gut-busting and money stress and create a true trade business. Hey, hey, tradies in business, how you doing? I was only going to say something else then, Coxie. I thought you were going to say, how is it hanging? I was, I was, <laughs> and then I changed it and now you've dropped me in it anyway. Oh, well, yeah. I said it, so I didn't, I dropped myself <laughs> <Yeah>. in it. <laughs> What's happening, listeners? Hope you're having a good week. How's your back end of the year looking? We're rolling into Christmas. I'm sure you're feeling relaxed and cruisy. I'm sure. Um, no stress at all at the moment. <laughs> Well, that's it. Oh, I see what you're doing here. Got though. The I'm impressed. Font on and the Chuck Norris segue coming up. Speaking of stress and uh, the effect it can have on our lives, we've got an interesting guest on today's episode, Coxie. It's a cracking episode. Very interesting. Interesting is the perfect choice of words. And uh, fairly broad range of topics. I must admit, I was struggling when I was thinking, what are we going to title this episode? Because mm. Um, We have a fantastic chat today with Odell Harris, also known as Odds Harris, um, who has a very colourful story, I guess, Mm. and it's appropriate to use that word, um, because we do talk a lot about Odell's story. Um, He was a very high-level footballer for a number of years. Uh, He's been a professional jiu-jitsu instructor for 18 years um, and I managed to offend him mortally and refer to him <laughs> BJJ when, in fact, it was Japanese jiu-jitsu, the original. I don't even know what BJJ is. Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Oh. Uh, that's that the one they, that you see everyone They doing. dance around and... No, no, no. BJJ is what most middle-aged white men uh, go and get involved in at some stage these days. Okay. Uh, and you wear a pair of pyjamas and you roll around on the mat with other sweaty men trying to hurt them. That sounds like a bunch of fun. (laughs) So uh, he's a surfer. He loves the water. He's a photographer and a content creator. And now he's he's, um, basically a professional content creator for Mm. a landscaping business. Uh, And um, does a little bit of side work there, a bit of a side hustle, I suppose. Mm. We do talk a lot. No, we talk about a lot of different things Mm. with Odell. And um, I think, you know, no matter who you are and what stage you're at in your business or your life. Um, I think there's something in today's episode for you. Um, We bounce around a bit as is uh, the usual way here at Traders in Business. But um, I particularly like uh, Odell's um, quote about how to stop the thumb. And I'll leave it at that. I'll make you listen. (laughs) It's a cracker and and, a great episode. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of value out of this one. Yeah. So if you've got a social media account for your business, you really need to listen to this. And mm-hmm. um, if you've ever felt stress in your business, this one's for you too. There you go. We're pretty much <laughs> taking care of everybody. Enjoy. Righto. We are joined today by the one and only Odell Harris. <laughs> Welcome to the show, mate. Mate, long time listener, first time caller. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that still blows me away when people are stoked to be on our podcast because mm. uh, we're actually coming up to six years uh, on the show. And uh, yeah. I got put on to you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we're going to be, um, we're all in three different locations here. So the internet lag is going to play tricks on us all. But uh, it still does my head in that people are like, yeah, I've been listening to you. I just can't believe I'm on the podcast. And people are flipping <laughs> out about coming on the show. So I know Coxie's nervous every time she gets on here with me. Oh, well, I've, got, I've got a few little butterflies just this morning. I was like, ooh. <laughs> it's, but, it, um, I've, I got put on to you by a friend of mine, Selena. She was an Olympian. And you guys had her on yes. way back. I think yeah, that was yeah. – I'm not sure if you were hosting then. No, it was pre-Nicole. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't talk about pre-Nicole. Yes, we right, do. Okay. We talk about it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, we've had yeah. Some, some epic guests on the show. And, and I forget, actually, Odell, um, some of the guests. So I'm, I'm glad you just reminded me. You know, we've had Olympians. We've had marketing gurus. We've had 
uh, nutritionists. And I think best of all, we've had a whole bunch of real people. Not that any of those previous guests weren't real, but uh, <laughs> sorry to all of those that I just rattled off. Um, but I, I think the biggest strength in our podcast is, is people like you. Uh, just, you know, I guess what we would collectively refer to as just everyday blokes and sheilas that are doing their thing and yet they have such amazing stories and I know you've got some really cool stuff to share today and, and uh, we'll do our best to uh, get that out uh, on the <laughs> podcast, mate. But we're also going to talk about, I suppose, a passion of yours, I guess it is, Adele, which is video. So we'll just put that out there straight away. Um, yep. Video for business, if we just clarify that straight up. Yeah. Given yeah. that we're recording this on a Friday and I'm in a bit of a mood today. Content. It's, it's more sort of called content for business because I do not just video, but photography, podcasting. Nice. Things. Nice distinction, Odell. Thank you for saving me and um, <laughs> making this a much better episode than I will probably make it. Sorry, yeah. mate. I don't want to be the host of this. <laughs> Please do. Oh, oh, no. Someone needs to step in and uh, stop me from talking. So, <laughs> Odell, um, tell our listeners, uh, you know, you can start from, you know, day zero if you like, but give them a bit of background on yourself, man. What's your, what's your story? Okay, I'll give a, a brief because it's quite a long story. Um, but I guess, mate, I'm, I moved to Queensland as a footballer. So I've, I've been really fortunate that I had um, three different careers. I'm on my third at the moment. And just I'm not a tradie, okay, but I've served probably the amount of time in these three different careers. That Shh, we won't, we won't tell anybody. Yeah, yeah. But I've served these three different times in these careers where I should be qualified. You know, in those careers, should have got mm. a certificate in something. <laughs> um, so my f- first career was a was a footballer or an athlete. I moved to Ipswich, where Coxie is there, mm-hmm. um, to play there. And my dream was to be in the NRL. That never happened, but I spent eleven years trying to chase it. Um, of those eleven years, I got three three years where I was full time, and um, and yeah, I never got there. But then the the next one was a jujitsu instructor. So that was full time, eighteen years, and that sounds like a, you know, one of those jobs where everyone goes, oh, it's just a, something you do on the side. But it was a, it was a natural career. You mm-hmm. start off like an apprenticeship. You do like a teaching, sort of um, trade. You know, there's a, in this sort of system, there's all these modules where you got to learn about psychology and you know, discipline and mm. uh, teaching, essentially. Mm. So that that took eighteen years, and I finished that two years ago. I uh, walked away from that one and now I'm doing uh, content for a, for a landscaping company, Everscapes, full-time and I have a little side business called Midas Media House where I do a couple of um, clients there. Wow. That's such a diverse yeah. range of careers. Um, we were talking a little bit off-air about your football career. That That's, uh, that's really tough. Uh, aiming for NRL. I have three boys, all have at one time or another aspired to go on with their football. Um, mm. I understand some of the highs and lows and what that has meant for them. And we were talking off air also about resilience and how that built resilience very much for them uh, because they went through those crushing disappointments of finally understanding they're not going to be a superstar like they'd like to be. But oh, they have man. friends that play NRL. We've got a, a couple of... Um, club members have gone on to play so you know that 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 uh crushing disappointment must have been quite challenging to work your way through yeah it was it was and i didn't know for a few years that it was that's what was affecting me mm. um so i finished my career in england right I, I um wanted to go to england and i actually left my family here which i shouldn't have really done my young daughter and my, my partner and um when i got back it was I was just sort of zombified because, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, no club wanted me. Um, you know, I didn't, I went to a union club and thought, oh, well, I'll get a gig over in Japan because I speak a tiny little bit of Japanese. <laughs> so that, that's what I thought I'd get. That was a good, good way to make a decision, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll be right. I'll be right. <laughs> Not that I've played union for years, you know. And then, and then yeah, just I didn't enjoy the game and, and lasted four training runs, I think, and and then that was that was my retirement. I was mm. like, okay, I'm done. And um, it took me a bit of drinking and a fair few years of just 
because I identified as a footballer. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then, you know, I lost my lost the identity there. And um, that was really, really hard to do. And I didn't accept that and did a lot of personal development after and, you know, realised that, that was a that was a few years of just um, a, not depression, but I don't know what you call it. Just not fitting in, I guess. Mm. Finding your way. Yeah. yeah it's a pretty and good that, thing. Uh, and uh, I've, I've heard that kind of thing shared by a number of um, particularly sports people uh, where they, they work for so long towards that, that um, I guess the outcome of their career, which is getting to a certain level, you know, getting a full-time gig, getting in with a particular club or whatever it might be, you know, getting a seat in a driving team or something like that in a race team. And then to not actually get there, it's like the ultimate invalidation of self. I mean, it sucks. And that's, that's what I was going to be from five years old. I was always going to be a footballer. You know? um, and that's, that's what I identified with. When I went to school, uh, there was a high school. I went to 10 different schools, right? We moved around a lot. But anyway, when I went to um, high school, it was football or surfing. And I was better at football, so I went football. <laughs> that and, was why um, I did accounting, because I was better at accounting at school. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not quite as Someone, quite someone's as got to do the numbers <laughs> <laughs> Very I hate true. it, I hate it. But yeah so and that was and I've really looked back on that and just seen from points of going oh right I could see it slipping away there and I still didn't realise and see it slipping away and mm. didn't want to accept it mm. um, yeah it was tough because also when I, when I was playing like Q Cup and that they're pretty good levels of footy um, and this was pre-social media. Social media was coming in towards the end of my career stuff. Um, and there was that football culture of, you know, drinking and teammates. And when I left, I got injured in my second last year, or my last year in Australia. And, um, yeah, I wasn't part of the team. And it sucked, man. Like on a Saturday night. Mm. Just, yeah. Yep. yep. And it's, it's something that, I think a lot of our listeners could identify with not necessarily from a sporting perspective, but from a trade perspective is that they identify as a plumber, a builder, a sparky, a landscaper, whatever it is. And, and, you know, when they don't win a job, when the, the client turns them down for a quote or a builder goes and uses somebody else in their trade and, and picks a different plumber. Um, it's like, it's like that, form of rejection but also when they want to develop their business and i know we'll talk about this a bit more today as well and be more of a business owner they're actually you know having to give up their identity as a a builder and become a business owner they're two different identities and and we see guys especially but we see you know tradespeople really struggle with that in a lot of cases because they're having to make this massive shift of just mannerisms and uh you know you talk about the saturday night thing it's like builders do particular things on particular days of the week and they they have particular pursuits and activities and then you know that changes when you become the owner of a building business like they're different identities and it's it can be really challenging for a lot of people yeah you have to be more professional yeah and like mix with different people yeah yeah yep so mate uh how did you go from that sort of realization and then into bjj instructing like was that was that an easy progression like how did that actually come about uh, so it's japanese jiu-jitsu instructor yeah, i do okay. do bjj i do do bjj yeah, right but on. japanese jiu-jitsu was the the career um yeah cool even that's <laughs> oh, no i'm not gonna say that, <laughs> gonna say that. <laughs> we'll start a war yeah yeah <laughs> Um, I actually remember the moment I saw I saw an ad in the paper and it was like, are you sports minded? You know, do you want a career in sports? And I'm like, yeah, I do. I'm trying to do one and I'm, yeah, yeah. I, prob- I probably should look at something else. Because while I was playing footy, you know, I've driven loaders, I've laboured, you know, I've done building, building sites, done things just to get money in mm. and keep the bills paid and, and mm. you know, everyone happy. Um, and so I was... <sighs> What I was, tw- I don't know, 20, 20 something maybe, maybe just near, near 20. 
and I saw this ad because there was a crossover there too. Um, and I saw the ad in the paper and thought, I need to start thinking about life after footy. Um, and just, you know, I applied for it. I went, yeah, okay, cool. I'll, I'll give this a nudge, see how it goes. And it was awesome. Wow. I, um, we deal with a lot of tradies one-on-one or in a small group. I can't imagine, uh, presumably you would have been teaching children as well as adults. There would have been a, a real cross section of the community that you're teaching. Mm-hmm. And I don't know a lot about martial arts. I'll put my hand up. I did do Taekwondo as a teen. So I, I get the discipline and I get the control and those amazing elements I can imagine it would actually be pretty challenging to take a bunch of kids in particular, but even the the complex personalities of adults, put them together and have them conform to the exact way things need to be done. That would be um, pretty tough, I would think. You'd be thinking about so many different things and personality clashes and Mm. ensuring that we're being respectful. And there's a lot, it's quite complex. There's a lot involved in that. Was that something you found challenging or fell into quite easily because of the experiences you'd had through football? Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a big kid, right? So I love to have fun. And, um, you know, I was, I was responsible for a lot of the bringing up of my sister. So I'm pretty good around kids. Um, and yeah, so that, that part was all good, but they did, you know, they did teach you, you got, you got time and, uh, lectures on how to deal with them, and mm. and is a Japanese, you know, based uh, martial arts, so it's very rigid, mm. very bow, yeah, you know, use your manners, all that sort of stuff. But one of the great things about it was I got to implement, um, uh, uh, what's it? Not morals, but um, uh, what's when you have things that you believe in? I don't know the word. I've forgotten. Yeah, yeah. don't know. Anyway, we get what you're saying anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you, get to, you get to, like, steer kids in that direction. Yeah. So, you know, I'd have kids that had, that had um, Values, kids. I suppose. Yeah, you know, I, I was under second generation kids, second mm. generation students, you know, like kids that had kids and then brought them to me. Yeah, yeah. And um, I got a message the other day from one of my kids and I haven't taught, I haven't taught for two years. And he said, um, since Odell, I graded today to my brown, second brown belt, which is the completion of the kids' syllabus. And he said, just wanted, to send, just wanted to say thank you. You taught me not only jiu-jitsu, but also values. Values, that was the word I was talking about oh, yes, before. Yeah. Values. And um, you also taught me to always carry my school bag and never let my parents do it. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. And I was stoked. Like that, 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 was, uh, that was a reward, massive reward of the job, being mm. involved yeah. in those Absolutely. Lives. As a parent too, like you, you, you're constantly striving for people like yourself who carry that responsibility uh, so well to be involved in their lives. Like a lot of the decisions when I think about my kids who I've, I've made a lot of decisions in their life based around who will be in that place, whether it be their school, choosing their school for my kids was very much based on their, their teachers and their principal and having those values, but also even our football clubs. We, we moved clubs, which is a big no, no, you never do that. You know what it's like. Mm. Adele, it, it's, if you can avoid it, you don't, but we actually took kids out of one club and into another because we were chasing like-minded people with the same sort of values. So as a parent, it's amazing to think that there are people that still consider that in a world where it would be easy to think they don't. Um, it, I feel like frequently when we look around and we observe social media and we look at what our kids are doing and where they're going, it would be easy to slip into thinking that nobody is still out there caring for our kids and taking their mental health, particularly because what you're talking about there with instilling values, etc., is helping with their mental health long term. It's instilling those lessons now while they're young. Um, did you ever think about it like that? Did you ever really realize what a huge role you were playing in their lives? Uh, yeah, I did because you know, I got a lot of feedback that um, you know that's what you were doing. But also, I cared about all my students, uh, and it was just you know you get some jobs and even tradies. You know, like I go out on site now, and you can see that the guys, some of the guys, don't care about their job, mm-hmm. and you can see the ones that are passionate about their craft because it is a craft. You know, some of these guys are like plumbers. Um, Chippies, and you can see if they finish the work really nicely. We've got a tiler at the moment that's doing a, a pool. 
an incredible artist, right? Mm. And he's so passionate about his job. He, he's millimeter perfect. So he'll lay all the tile out. And if it doesn't sit properly, he'll take it off and shave it down millimeters at a time and then put it back down dry. And so he cares about his job and I cared about my students. Mm. Yeah. And, and the betterment as well, you know. I wanted the best for them. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a great lesson we can take into every avenue of our life. Maybe as tradies and business owners, we could be caring more about our clients yeah. and, yeah, and well, the results client, we deliver. Your client is number one, right? Mm. If you don't have clients, you don't have a business. Or money and, in the bank. And team That's members right. as well. I think, I think staff. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Staff and subbies, you know, I, mean, I think – uh, there's not subbies, not subbies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just perpetuate the stereotype. Uh, <laughs> but it is, you know, there's there's a, a tendency to negativity about employees and subbies, and there's just this idea that the baseline is that they're they're you know no good, they don't work hard, they take the Mickey on their timesheets or whatever, instead of I guess seeking the good and looking for the good in people. And I think that's what, for me, that's what people like you do well, Odell, is actually, you know, you take a kid and you, you seek the good in them and you actually build that and you grow the good, you grow those positive aspects in people. And that can actually overgrow any of, or a lot of the negative traits that all of us have within us. We've all got you know, without getting too too crazy about this, we've all got evil within us. We've all got greed and selfishness and all that sort of stuff. But I think for a lot of us, the the grass that we want has been tended and fertilized and cultured and it just, it chokes out the bad stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I think guys like you and, and girls like you are, not that you're a girl, really important in... Sometimes. <laughs> in business because, you know, we can take an employee, a young guy or girl tradesperson who maybe doesn't care enough and perhaps lacks some of that attention to detail and find those good aspects and actually develop that and grow that in those people instead of just yeah. complaining about how shit they are all the time and then they just stay shit. Mate, I, I left um, jiu-jitsu for a little bit, uh, just periodically one time, and I went and worked at um, Dulux, so in a factory job, right, because the pay was awesome. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I need more money. And there was a guy there, I think his name is Kev, old, he's an old boy. And, um, <clears throat> Not you know, Kev. no, no, he's only a little fella, but he's old. <laughs> but he was there, for, he must have been there for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, and, he, you know, that was his thing. That was where he was going to go. And he was just on the line. But he would pick up and make and walk around after me and make me pick up, you know, all these little bits of tin because that can go in the recycling bin. That's an extra two cents in the company's pocket, you know. Clean that up. Wow. You know, don't leave that shit there. And this is a multi-million dollar company. Mm. Wow. And, he, and he's doing those little bits there, you know. Um, so you have guys like that in, in your company. It's, it's, it's awesome. And... You know, I already had a good work ethic, but he, he really um, brought it through again. Just made me remember. Mm. Mm. It is easy to forget, particularly when we're working for big companies such as that one. Um, I'm intrigued, Odell. We don't, we're not, we're all born very much the same, but we're not all born with the same set of values or mm. a value system. So somebody has to have taught that to you as you were growing up. Is that something that was come from the family? Did it come from outside influences? Where did that start for you? Uh, well, there's probably two distinct parts. So when I, before I did jiu-jitsu, I didn't like people, um, you know, and I was untrusting of people and that brought me out a lot. But growing up, uh, so I was, I was brought up on a council flat I was in housing commission, single mum. Uh, when when my my dad abused my mum, when we left, he chased us with a double barrel shotgun that was loaded. Um, and then so we got away. Uh, and you know he was he was present throughout my life, sporadically. Mm. After that, I was we were on this council flat, and my mum's probably the one who gave me the value. She was always encouraging. Be there. Yep. Yeah. Phone call. So, <laughs> Oops. Hang on. See, my mum was probably 
the one responsible for those values. She was always encouraging. I remember, you know, her just telling me, you can do anything, anything. You can do anything you want to do, right? Uh, every day, you're, you're awesome, you're amazing. Um, you can do anything you want to do. And then, so there used to be this person I'd visit at the Housing Commission and, and I'd get food because I'd always visit all the places and eat. I love eating. <laughs> <laughs> And they'd give me biscuits and stuff. And I was on my billy cart and a drunk driver ran over me. Oh, and, um, Yeah, yeah. And uh, my stepdad, I didn't, obviously didn't know him yet, but he was the first copper on the scene. So he attended. Um, they got me out of there. Like my, my billy cart was a wreck, but mum reckons it was like a force field. She, she's like, the hand of God. <laughs> and touched you, you're fine. Your billy cart was destroyed. Yeah, but he was a fir- he was the first copper on the scene, and then he didn't leave. Wow! Was, yeah, so he ended up marrying my mum really <laughs> quickly, <laughs> and um, they spent thirty years together. But that was that was a pretty volatile relationship. He he um, you know, he was really really strict. And mm. He probably gave me he gave me the work ethic, and um, you know, he he loved me, but he was very very hard. Like I'd always get. Hit. Here's an example. I learnt my times tables by coming home. Uh, he'd be sat at the table. He'd give me the, sh- the sheet, the questions. I'd get a minute to study, pass them back to him. Then he'd start the clock. I'd have to do them more. I'd get X amount of time to do them. Then I'd have to pass them back and I'd have to watch him mark them. And for every one I got wrong, I got hit. Wow. So, so that's the sort of, he was quite disciplinary and I guess you'd call it. Yeah, yeah. I always had jobs to do. I was always, yeah. Yeah, we're just we're not equipped well enough to mentor other people. You know, it's it's like there seems to be this idea that it's just an innate skill that we have, and I and I don't I don't believe that it is me personally. That's just my own opinion. I feel like with modern life, we've lost a lot of that intergenerational knowledge transfer, and I mean that's relevant for the trades, and we've talked about that on the podcast before as well is the way things are done now. It's like, we're supposed to learn everything from a book and we're not actually following the Tyler around that you were mentioning earlier and actually watching him shave millimeter by millimeter off the back of the tile so that it sits down and doesn't cause a lip. And Mm. you know, you can't, you can't really learn that from a book. You've got to, and for a lot of us, we're visual and, and hands on learners, particularly men. And I feel like, parenting is one of those things you know parenting and teaching and mentoring we're just we're thrown into it largely and i think a lot of us are just making it up as we go and it's the outcome is not necessarily good no but that's when you educate yourself right so we choose to yeah yeah you know i saw a psych a few years ago and that's what that's why i'm okay with a lot of this stuff Mm -hmm. you know like my dad my stepdad I'm sure he was trying to make me a little assassin or something because it always showed me like, <laughs> like uh, you know, all these disarm techniques for guns and all this stuff and it'd take me out shooting. And when we lived out bush, I had my own, like air rifle and 22, I was allowed to go shoot. And, uh, yeah, just there's always, uh, anyway, lots of stuff. Mm. It's um, interesting how we show our care and our consideration and our love and uh being i have a i had a stepmother she passed away um and i'm in a blended family i have a blend i have a blended family i am in it but i do have one Mm. so get my language right but it's interesting the more people i come across in these tight relationships that i have how varied uh the love is and how they show it you know it sounds i'm listening to you and i'm well out of the situation and i'm sure that he was trying in his own way to create the man that you are now Mm. without understanding how detrimental some of that stuff was he he still smacked me (laughs) like a fair bit you know (laughs) six of the best was his big thing Mm. you knew you were in trouble if you got six of the best yep how do you help you and I got sent to a school with the last cane. So one of the last ones that had the cane, they purposely sent me there. I got <laughs> a cane at school, got it at home. Wow. Mm. Well, but, it, did, it make you scared. Like I'm sitting here thinking I would be absolutely shit scared all the time. You'd be so anxious about 
what you might do now to tip him off again. Probably, but I was, yeah, but I was real angry. Yeah. Like even before he came along, I was, my, my dad was, you know, they both encouraged me to fight. They loved it. Um, and so the first, he, he, the first um, dinner where my stepdad came over, so I had run of the house. Mum, you know, she couldn't discipline me. If she, if she hit me with a stick, I'd grab it off her, break it, laugh at her, you know, doesn't even hurt. Ah. Because you're not a so, little bloke, are you, Adele? I was then. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably still bigger than me now. We're, we're talking little, little, right? So he came along when I was five. Um, so, yeah, he's at the dinner table and mum puts dinner down for, for me and I said, I don't want that. That looks yuck. Um, I want something else. And she would normally make it for me. Um, and Ross, oh, my stepdad said, uh, nah, he'll eat what we eat or he won't eat at all. And so I'm five and a half probably. I put my fist up like this at him, like scowling at him, and he reached over and crushed it. <laughs> wow. And I didn't cry. I remember not crying and just staring at him. It was just like bang. And that's what a lot of our, a lot of our energy, I guess, was a lot of yeah. the time. Mm. And those things um, get perpetuated through generations, you know, yeah. because, because... And that's the way he was brought up, right? That's right. Exactly. And so then he brings up his kids or stepkids or whatever that way and then they, mm. they just naturally take on that way of doing things and, and I, I don't want to downplay the personal nature of your story, but I will anyway because this is a yeah. kind of a business okay. podcast. But for, for people listening to this... They're doing this in their businesses. They're doing this in their own families and teams and, and, you know, business communities where, well, you know, I was shouted at as an apprentice and that's how I learned. I had hammers thrown at me and blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> you know, what's wrong with that? Uh, you know, I remember walking into a mechanics workshop years ago as a customer or I was potentially going to be a customer, but I walked out again and I walked into <laughs> to the foyer to see a spanner flying behind the the half wall behind the counter across the workshop and hitting the opposite wall and someone's shouting at a, obviously a young guy and then the business owner appeared and yeah. you could see he'd just, just been the guy shouting and, and hurling a spanner across the workshop. I was like, yeah, that don't worry about it, mate. I'm, I'm out. Yeah. Probably won't do the work for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll find someone else. But you know, he was probably treated the same way as an apprentice mm. and it just, mm. it just gets perpetuated. Is it, have you made a conscious choice with some of this, Adele, to, I guess, break some of these cycles? Yeah, as a parent, yeah, for sure. So I would find myself doing some things that were, were exactly like I'd had done to me and I'd be like, all right, stop that. That's not, you know, you didn't like it as a kid. Your mm. kid's not going to like it. Mm. So, yeah, I've done the best with that. I think I can. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, mate. What what has helped you choose differently over the years? You know, instead of just sort of unconsciously yeah. repeating those things, what's helped you to actually make some better choices? Um, probably having to put yourself out there as a jiu-jitsu instructor. I understand it's a professional environment, you sure. know what I mean? And that you're there to deliver a service or a, a product and that, um, you know, you need to interact with these people and have rapport with them. Mm. So that, that first off started. Then my partners have been really, you know, my, my partner has been amazing um, with what she deals with and just the way she's changed me. So my mother, the women in my life have made me a better person, I think. And then I got psycho like psychological help. Oh, yeah. I saw so a psychologist because I was suffering with anxiety and... Um, uh, anger would be my normal function or go to, I think, as most men. Yep. Mm. And then we untangled that a lot, got some techniques for, to handle it. And uh, up until the other night, I haven't had an anxiety attack or suffered from anxiety for years now. Mm. Wow. That's awesome, man. Well done. Mm. Thanks, babe. But yeah, I don't, I'm sorry to get deep and everything on a business <laughs> podcast. No, no, that's cool. No, we we uh, often. <laughs> We often happily stray into those conversations, mate. Yeah, yeah you've been having some good um, mental health ones. I've been listening to the last couple. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important for us to share uh, because the more people that talk about this stuff, the more 
Exactly. People are then able to consider where they're at and what they might do to help themselves. And we've spoken on a podcast previously about um, having a team. And we have business teams, right? We have teams in our business. We've got accountants, business coaches, advisors, financial advisors, banks, insurance mm. people. We have that team. But I think often we forget that we need personal teams as well. And I, I've got a psychologist on my team when I'm, you know, going through a rough patch or something's coming up for me, we check base again. Um, my husband has one. He sees his every month. It's like his maintenance program to keep him on the straight and narrow, as he puts it. I, I think that it's something that we don't talk about enough. So it's great that you reference it, that you do have somebody in your corner as part of your team to help you, not just your partner, but that mm. professional um, outside view as well is so important. And you know what the massive thing, especially for being a, a male, is is they're non-judgmental. So you yes. can go to these things and not not feel judged. Um, you know, if you're talking to your best mate, you probably don't feel judged, but you might. Mm. Especially yeah. when you're talking about, you know, deep issues, mm. trauma, I don't know, abuse, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep. Things that affect you later in life, you know, especially. Yeah, most definitely. I'm if I may railroad this just a minute, I'd love to understand how you realized that what you were feeling was anxiety. Like how did you learn that that's. Well, it's really lucky that I didn't realize actually. So it's not lucky that, but it's really lucky that I had a mate that had suffered from it. And he, um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't believe him at first. So it took me a year or so. So the way it, and, it, and it's different for everyone, I think but anxiety for me, I had no depression. Right? Mm -hmm. I love life. I love surfing. I love being out in the ocean. But when it started to translate into that, I'd get I'd get dizzy. So I'd be out in the in the surf, and you know, I'd get dizzy. My palms would get not you know, sweaty. My heart rate would go up, and I'd be like, "What the hell is going on?" Mm -hmm. And because I'd been pretty in touch with my body my whole life, mm -hmm. I was like, "Right, it's a it's a tumor. It's a tumor. I mean, it's got to be." <laughs> so all these head knocks I've had, I'm I'm gone. You know, this yep. is like coming back to eat to bite me. I'm already busted. <laughs> my back stuff, my knees are stuffed. Now I've got a tumor. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd get dizzy um, and it'd just come out the blue and then I'd start avoiding places where it happened. And um, I was talking to my mate and I, I said to him, this is what's happening, man. This sucks. And he goes, oh, I reckon it's anxiety. And he's quite emotional in touch with his emotions and stuff. And I said, nah, that's for pussies, man. Mm. Um Oh, you know, I'll just harden up. That's that. That's not me. Then about a year later, uh, I'd had a, had a uh, been struggling with it on and off, um, and in the water it happened. Like I said, and nothing ever affects me generally in the surf. Yeah, it's you know that's my 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 place under the water and in the water. Yep. And I said to him, man, I got real dizzy out there and thought I was going to faint and blah blah blah. And he said, mate, I've, I've told you before, you got anxiety. Mm. these are all the symptoms of anxiety. Stop being a dickhead and go see someone. <laughs> <laughs> Loving advice. Um, yeah. Okay. okay, cool. How do I do that? He said, just go see your doctor. It's easy. And it is easy for those listening. It's, it's really easy. You go to doc your doctor, your GP, and if you're not comfortable with him, go to another one yep. or her, and they give you a test, a simple um, yep. multi-question test, mm -hmm. and then the results are, yep, you've got, my anxiety was off the Richter scale. I mm. mean, um, he's like, mate, uh, here's what you do. You get 10 free sessions. Then it was free. I don't know what it's like now. Mm. Um, 10 free sessions with the psycho psychiatrist or psychologist and you go to a psychiatrist, I think, that you pay for. The psychiatrist administer the drugs. Mm -hmm. Psychologists deal with the mental stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it was easy. The psychologist, psychiatrist, sorry, I didn't really get along with, didn't really like him. Uh, but I took the meds and I don't really like taking meds, but I did it for three months. Didn't, I just did much change, got off the meds. But my psychologist, um, and that's the thing with people who are going to gonna go, you might not resonate with the first one. Yeah. Right? But be open and just just be open to, to what can happen. Um, yeah. But mine was an ex-military guy. So, you know, really spoke my language, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and... It was amazing for me. And I, I went in and said, listen, this is what's happening. I want to be better to where I was. Like I was invincible before. Mm -hmm. And now well, I don't know what's going on. So if you give me the techniques, like I'm a former athlete, you give me the techniques. Actually, I'm still playing. If 
you give me stuff, I will implement it and I'll beat this. He's like, it's not really something you beat, mate. I'm like, well, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he gave me those techniques and he was amazing. He really changed my life mm. because I went and saw him. Mm. And because you were open to change. I, yeah. I think that's the thing, right? You have to be open to understanding why it's there. And I listen to you, story and I think, holy shit, I can't believe you got that far into life without it becoming such a big hurdle, well, a big part of your life. It was always there. Well, I learned to bury it really, really deep. Yes, <laughs> you must have. Um, so for me, looking in, it, I can understand wholeheartedly while it, why it was there. But you have to be in a space where you're open enough to making some change and looking at that tough stuff. It's doing the work. It's no different than being in business and your cash flows up the shit. You're going to have to do the work to make it better. Um, our mental health is the same. There is work to be done. You know, the other thing that really got me was, I was when, I, when I went and did it all, I was like, oh, it's quite common. Mm. Like, I'm not a rarity. <laughs> this is happening to quite a few people. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, I'm not special. This is, this is something we can deal with. Yeah. Well, you are special, but <laughs> you're not alone. And special so. and not alone, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for correcting me. Yeah. Right. I love it when you correct me. You're welcome. You can, you can take that out on me later. Um, and there, there are many more people that probably like you, Adele, are experiencing symptoms of something but just don't consider that it, could be anxiety or depression or panic or mm. any of those, you know, mental wellness issues. Uh, oh, you're exactly that, right, was. That Didn't even treatable. consider it was something to do with your head. <laughs> no, no. And, you know, you think about it, uh, our, our mind controls our body other than our, our lizard brain functions of survival. And so it makes sense that our body feels stuff that our mind is, is wrestling with. You know, we feel things physically that we're thinking about. You know, we can, we can induce fear and excitement and pleasure and all that stuff just by thinking about it. So, I mean, it all makes perfect sense for us sitting here having a rational conversation and, and the three of us have all had personal experience with this at various levels. But for a lot of people, and, and perhaps for you listening to this podcast, uh, maybe the light bulb might have gone on for you where it's like, holy shit, I feel that. You know, sometimes my heart's beating really fast and I don't know why and I think it must have just been the coffee this morning. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us get really good at fooling ourselves into believing that it's a tumour or it's too much coffee or it was just because I had a big night with the boys or something like that or I've been working hard lately when in reality it's it's more than that. And I think, you know, the sooner we acknowledge that it's more than that, the sooner we can actually do what you've done, Odell, and make some better choices. Yeah, it, it's yeah, and it is. It was amazing. Like going to get that help was amazing. Mm. So how's how's uh, life panned out since then? You know, I know it's not just one point in time, but can you give us an idea of you know you've embraced this, you've gone and and actually. Uh, accepted the challenge, I guess, uh, and yep. got, got someone else on your team. What sort of unfolded from there? In a mental health space? Yes, yeah, or and, just, and just in life in general? in your life, mate, yeah. Yeah, um, well, I kept teaching for a fair while. Um, everything was easier to deal with. And, and you know, it's stress predominantly, yeah. stress and upbringing. So with, with your upbringing is your stress, and you mm -hmm. just burrow it down, 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 deep yeah. down. And it eventually, it was explained to me really, really well. My psych first said, look, you've got all these buckets um, in life. And I've heard him talk financially and all that sort of thing, but he spoke about buckets in life. He said, you know, you've got a stress bucket and eventually if you don't put holes in that stress bucket, it's going to overflow. And mm -hmm. when it overflows, it might um, manifest in, you know, um, dizziness or sickness. Some people get sick from stress. Mm -hmm. Like I reckon it's probably, I'll do a bit of research on it and stuff. And a lot of these diseases are from stress. Mm -hmm. And people in trade, you know, business owners, they can get stressed. So you've got to have some downtime. Yeah. Right. And some tools to deal with that stress. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Who would have thought a trade business owner would need tools? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> well, they love tools. So it's just another one to add to the collection <laughs> yeah. along with the seven wheelbarrows. Yeah. <laughs> 
You know I've got four in my backyard. <laughs> I was stoked just to get one. <laughs> Anyway, so back to back to Odell. Coxie and I are joking about wheelbarrows here, mate. Um, so uh, jiu-jitsu instructing. Um, I do want to talk a bit about the the content creation side, and and I actually yeah. think I'm going to draw perhaps a long bow here. But I would I would throw it out there, and nobody has to agree with me on this that your backstory actually gives you an eye for content and a way of interpreting things that you see and turning that into something that's entertaining or relevant for, for people, whether it's podcasting video, you know, stills images, all that sort of stuff. And I've seen some of your work and listeners should definitely go check it out. We'll give all the links at the end. Um, what do you reckon, mate? Does do um, people with a, a, a bit of a, I guess a colorful history, create better content there's there's a controversial statement isn't it ah uh, i'm going to disagree it's yeah a, okay cool that, not not necessarily uh they can definitely create better content but it can still be crappy if they don't you know adhere to the rules of storytelling and mm. and um you know distributing it properly and recording with good audio that sort of stuff you know what i mean yep so yep. they oh. they might have they probably got amazing stories. You've got to learn how to tell, tell a story. Mm. So I didn't just get wake up one day and start creating content. I, um, I have had a PT business as well. We were one of the first ones uh, in Brisbane that did the outside stuff. So when we specialised in women's only, you know, I hired five guys and, um, yeah, we were, we, were, we were awesome and I started putting content around that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, research storytelling, researched a whole heap of stuff. YouTube is like your Bible, right? Yeah. Yep. So if you want to learn content creation stuff, get on there, follow people. Um, but if you're a business owner, it's really hard. It's a full-time job. So if you, you can have a full-time person running your Instagram. Mm. So you've got to make a decision. Are you an Instagrammer or are you a business owner? Mm-hmm. You know, and if you're a business owner and you haven't got time to put out content, you hire someone like me. Mm. And there's plenty out there, yeah, of varying levels. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, and I, I love that you disagreed with me, Adele, because it plays into a myth that seems to exist amongst business owners, and and particularly, I guess, our community here at Tradies in Business is that. Uh, and that's the thing that gets said to, to Coxie and I quite regularly. It's like, I don't have a story to tell. No one wants to hear what I've got to say. I don't, I don't have anything interesting to share. And so mm. there's this idea that it's only people like you that actually have an interesting story or have content worth sharing. But uh, everybody's got a story and humans like to hear other people's stories. I mean, lots of us like to stick our heads in echo chambers and listen to ourselves, but uh, mostly me. But, uh, you know, everyone has a story to share and every business has a story to share. It's just a matter of getting some of the fundamentals, I guess, made around how to do that well. Um, That's right. What's, what's some of the things that you learned? You know, you said you started with the PT business and, and went and studied, I, I guess, how to do this better. What's some of the things that you learned early on? Uh, well, storytelling is, ma- is everything, right? It, you take a photo, you want to tell the story. Um, are you asking me what I learned early on? Ah, uh, what did I learn? Just uh, you have. All right. So back in the day, and you did be privy to this. You'd have some campaign or marketing piece, and three or four touch points, and then your customer becomes a lead. Right. Mm-hmm. Now with all the noise, social media, everything, it's like twenty-two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you've got to have something that stops the thumb, stops yeah. the scrolling. Or builds interest. So, I'll give you a little. I've just done a video. It's not finished yet, but um, I got the owner of a property to jump in the pool for me. <laughs> so, but what it's going to do is I'm going to reverse that. So he comes out of the pool, all the water comes falling off him, and then he starts talking to camera. And if I'm seeing that, I'm like, "Wow, that's different." Yeah. yeah. And that that stops. So you got to get someone's attention within. Oh, it used to be three seconds, but now I reckon it's one. Yeah. Yep. Um, so once you get their attention and then, you know, deliver that content, whether it be educational, informational or entertaining, if it's all three, that's money. 
Mm. <laughs> There's your viral video. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or well, yeah, that's a thing. You can have a viral video and it doesn't doesn't increase your bottom line. No. Or your followers. I, I can remember doing a course on Facebook, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago now, and everyone was chasing the viral post or the viral the viral whatever. I've had several and it did nothing for my business. It did nothing for even my Facebook likes, my social media. All it did was in, increase my the eyes on what I was doing at the time. But that didn't mm. translate to anything. It didn't help me at all. But good no. quality, consistent content made a difference i think that's that so was i think that's probably the the main thing what nick said there is consistency so i learned consistency because mm-hmm. that, that if you're putting out viral content like you said nick consistently then mm-hmm. you're going to get the, the following and everything that's right mm-hmm. and Absolutely. i think it's changed even if we look at social media is obviously a big passion of mine and if we look at instagram and the, the, the way that space has changed in five years is absolutely mind-blowing and trying as a business owner to understand those changes and the way then consumers are taking that content in, mm. consuming the content, it's impossible to stay on top of. So as you said, having someone full-time that is abreast of the changes, that understands where to even find the information to understand what the changes are going to be so you can change on the fly instead of yep. six months behind the time and you've already missed it like i missed tiktok sorry didn't see that coming but that's okay because i was ready for reels but do you know what i mean like it's 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 that in itself just having the knowledge and and the ability to find the knowledge is almost a full-time job on its own before you even create the content yeah exactly and uh was to your question before that's what kept me current as well teaching all these kids so Mm -hmm. fidget spinners i was well ahead of fidget spinners when it was when it came in uh, all the crazes, you know. You just look at your kids, what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Talk to your kids, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like a barometer. Talk to them. What's going on? What's happening? Yeah. yeah. That's right. And uh, be interested in their screen time. So, you know, they go straight in their room. They're on their screen. Jump in. What are you doing? What are you on? Tell me what's going on. Like my daughter got me into Instagram. Wow. Um, that's that's probably my favorite platform. Me too. Oh. Still a happy place. <laughs> oh, I mean for growing because you know my photography I try I do a lot of surf photography a lot of water stuff um, I'm trying to build a brand around that but that, yeah that's a, that's probably my favourite platform I reckon mm. yeah that, Matt, actually it's probably a really good thread to follow there the changes even in um, Facebook Facebook's become like a commentary site it, yeah. it's it, and very much pay to play but it's, very, you know, even for business, it can be so challenging now um, with particularly the changes in society in the past 12 months. Uh, it can be very hard to find space on Facebook for people to see and hear you. Mm-hmm. Engagement you equals engagement, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> so incredibly true. And that's a tricky line to play. Like, are you going to play into that, buy into those arguments? Are you going to buy into the controversy? Is that the way you're going to make yourself stand out or are you going to find another platform that works for you? And that comes back to your business story. If you're, if you're involved in politics, then for sure, get into it. Mm-hmm. But if you're not, stay away from it, man. Totally. We unfortunately it's just got see, no relevance. No. And um, we're all opinionated. We're born with opinions. They form really quickly. Some of us have very strong opinions and uh, your Facebook business page is not generally the place where you're leave them and yet we yeah. see it happen all the time and hasn't these platforms just given everyone a voice like was yeah. um like we were saying before there's no way 10 of these people would have said anything that would say online to me to my face because mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. you would just crush them yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah it's and now crazy. it's keyboard warriors yeah and yeah. you know you get people just bagging the business my, my daughter is she she's on instagram a fair bit with her work um you know there's People just tear shreds off her. She models for them, does models, modeling yep. for them. Yep. And um, you know, people would not say this to her face. No. Mm. So that, that's a fascinating point, actually, because one of the big issues that we see with um, tradies in business is a reluctance to do video, especially, mm. um, uh, especially when it's got them in the video, mm. yep. uh, which is such a... a an easy way to build a relationship with people who aren't yet customers is, is, you know, make yourself real and make it personal and all those sorts of things. And yet you look at 
the flip side, and maybe it's the dark side of our, our nature, is this willingness to say just really awful things to people and get into arguments and, you know, tear others down. And yet they're reluctant to stick a video of themselves up. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. And maybe if there's some ways to overcome that um, for our listeners and, and business owners out there. Yep. So I do put myself on camera a fair bit, especially with the work um, that I do. I've, I've pulled back a little because we want to make someone else the face of the business. Mm. And it was like sort of becoming, oh, this is your business. It's like, no, it's not my business. I'm employed there. Um, but you've, I think if you're a business owner, definitely put yourself out there, but keep it all professional. Mm. You know, if someone has a go at your personal attack at them, on you, block them. Just block them or, or delete the post, uh, delete the um, comment. Don't let it deter you. Even better if, is if you change their mind through the comments. Mm. So, you know, they might say, oh, listen, you did a shit job at such and such a place. And then you say, you know, you comment back. And people can see that, 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 that you're um, engaging with that customer and that you're trying to turn things around. Mm. And they might, you might say, oh, look, we're really sorry that happened. Um, here's a number. We'll fix this by this time or whatever it is. You know, we'll, we'll have a solution for you. And again, keeping the client in front of mind. Mm. Yeah, that positive response is really important. And we've talked on the show before about bad reviews and how to deal with those. And it's, it's a similar thing, you know, rather than get into a he said, she said, it's just put forward yeah. the solution. It's like, hey, here's we've what got, we're going to do. We've got a terrible review sitting on one of our um, in Google review and it's from someone that wasn't even a client. Yeah. <laughs> just, just got on and, and reviewed it. And, but, you know, we put in there, look, we can't find your file. Um, we can't find the address. We can't find the, the project that you're talking about. Feel free to give us a call. Perfect yep. response. Yeah. And that's all you can really do. If it, was, yeah. uh, if it was a client, then we'd be, you know, scrambling to get it, cool. get it changed. Yeah. So, and you can't get them taken down, unfortunately. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy world we live in. You can say whatever you like. Um, How is that? Hey, you can say, you can just bag a business yep. and, the, and the business can't, can't get it taken down. It's Don't horrible. get started on personal responsibility in this world. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, this is um, a podcast for, you know, helping people who want to change, tips, mm. advice, all that sort of stuff. Definitely. I, I guess, you know, in terms of content um, and particularly the visual side, I mean, that's obviously a big part of what you do, Adele, is visual content, storytelling content. Are there some some like baby steps that people can take. You know, if they're listening to this and going, oh, I'm so sick of you guys saying I've got to get on video. I hate video. Yep. Uh, are there some little things people can start with that will get the ball rolling for them, Adele? I've got a list. Hey. Oh, I love a list. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I've got some things you can work on. So uh, my advice is to look at who else is doing it well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then take notes and implement what they're doing. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't don't necessarily go for the for the you know the the, the best and everything that they're doing, but just take little steps. Yep. Uh, get your story right, and as I said before, um, have those three things: educate, inf- inform, or entertain, mm-hmm. and build your story around that. Um, something within Instagram that that I you know I I use and talk to other people about using and all that sort of thing is five pillars. Uh, you can do three if it's if Five is too hard, but talk to five pillars and that'll give you constant content. So for instance, let's uh, we'll take this one, Tradies for Business, your, your podcast. One of your um, content pillars might be the guest. Then it'll be the backstory of the guest. Then it'll be what you guys are up to this week. Um, what project or who was a new client for you? And then perhaps a video about the week that was. Mm. A project that got sorted, um, and any any trade like chippy plumber, those sort of building trades can work to those five pieces of content. You know, a project that's coming up, yeah, the process of the project, uh, the the talk about the um, the design that went into it, uh, the client maybe if they're up for it, mm. and then 
the finished product mm. or a testimonial or something like that. Mm. Yeah. So that's your five pillars. Five pillars is, 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 can be tough, but you just recycle, recycle, just flick through all the time, different projects, but those five pillars always talk about those five things. So mm. Mm. You know, my, myself, I talk about mental health, um, surf photography, how to do surf photography. This is on my own personal brand, obviously. Brand, such a wanker. <laughs> 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 um, and my family, and then I'll I'll give more uh, like an underwater shot. Yeah. So Thanks there's 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 some content things. Um, just use your phone. Yeah. All right. You don't need to go get better gear until you start wanting to up your production. So use your phone. Most of them have got a camera in it. Uh, be aware of audio, so don't record next to a tipper or you know a loader. Um, wait for a pause in that uh, and start getting your head on camera. If you're not comfortable getting your head on camera, point it towards whatever action is going on. Mm. And when you, when you, I've, I've had a look at a few other, you know, I'm always constantly looking at other people's competitors' um, pages and social and all that sort of thing. It becomes boring if you just show one thing for too long. Mm. So if you're showing a project, Really walk around the project. Don't just you know walk into the gate and knock into something, and then it's like, what are you filming? Did you film that with a potato? You know. <laughs> oh my goodness, I see that so frequently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Then, then there's little cheap things you can get, so you can buy a stabilizer for your camera or for your phone, sorry, uh, and that'll up your production quality. Then you can get a cheap microphone if you're a lavalier bike. Um, that will up your production quality. And we're only talking within $300 here for both things, yep. mm-hmm. um, which I'm sure could be the marketing budget. Um, yeah, that'll, that'll up your production quality too and start to look at things different, just a little differently, mm. you know. Oh, and here's the big one. What do you enjoy? So if you're scrolling through Instagram, what do you enjoy? You know, take note of that. Why do you like it? Mm. Mm. And if, if Instagram's not your thing, don't do Instagram. Mm. You know, do Facebook. And if Facebook's not your thing, find another platform. Mm. And if they're not your thing, um, hire someone. Yeah, I was going to say help. outsource yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, outsource it. But that, and don't give it to the, to the person that doesn't enjoy it either. You know, if you've got yeah, an office yeah. admin person that, that's like, oh, I'll just flick it to them, another responsibility, and they hate doing it, it's not going to work. It's just not going to be on brand and it's not going to – the content's going to be crap and mm. you probably do yourself a disservice. Yep. Mm. Yeah, you can, uh, to reference one of our clients, you can spend a lifetime building a reputation and destroy it in a couple of seconds and the same oh, yeah. head with your social media, right? You can work your butt off trying to make that fantastic, looks great and you can just, it can be one post that falls hard and it can destroy your credibility and it's, it's gone. So it's worth being considered and measured about what we do. Well, then you've got to keep it professional. I, was, I did take a, um, a screenshot of someone else, a competitor, not, fortunately not in Australia, but a competitor's um, feed the other day and I was going to share it here, but it's, he's, it's uh, Titty Tuesday. It's, a, it's a picture of a, a nude um, you know, topless girl, which no. we all, you know, most of us love, but, but yeah, it's, no, but no know, it's not me. professional, man. No. I was like, what are you doing? No, that's incredible, isn't that's it? This, oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> and and this guy's or oh, this this business, you know, they they go into people's homes. Yeah. Think, there's another one. Think about your audience. Yes. Yep. Who's your audience and who's your target? Yeah. That's right. And yep. so. Yeah, and I I feel like that's a massive one, Adele, to sort of finish on is this whole content creation and telling stories and all that sort of stuff, you know, I think a lot of us forget to consider our audience. I know sitting here on the podcast, sometimes it's easy to forget who's listening and, Mm. you know, we talk to guests and I like to go off into philosophy and social commentary and all that sort of stuff. And I find myself thinking, hang on, there's thousands of business owners listening to this. Do they actually want to hear about this stuff? Are they getting value out of it? And it's, and it's a question I try and ask myself more often. I could probably do a better job of that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, I think, you know, and, and even my suggestion would be go talk to some of your great customers. Yeah. Say, hey, what, what sort of stuff have you liked 
from our social channels? What's, what's been interesting to you or what else are you looking at? Like go and talk to them, go ask some of your good clients. A lot of them will be stoked that you give a shit to actually go ask them and get their opinion. Mm -hmm. And as Coxie said, everyone's got an opinion these days. Mm -hmm. And if you're like me, you you share it everywhere. So (laughs) you should be asking for that debrief feedback. That should be something you, you, um, bring to your team you know if you've constructed a building go talk to the people that you built it for and then say where do we go wrong what can we do yeah. better for the next client mm-hmm. yeah yep um Bit of- but yeah i really like that uh to consider who your content's for mm-hmm. because you know we, we spoke about mental health and stuff but that might not be what some of the business owners are interested in yeah. you know i talk about surf photography and getting in the water and all this <laughs> stuff but some people don't give a shit yeah, yeah. A lot of us are not into surfing, surprisingly. Yeah, I don't know. I, I like the water though. I can't sort of flail around in the water, but you get me on a board too. could be challenging. Yeah. Cool beans. Now, Odell, there is a question I haven't asked it for a while, but I really want to ask you, mate. Um, well, I might, I might not have heard this one. Uh, <laughs> I bet you have. It's, it's, it's one of. Uh, it's the question I started asking six years ago of our guests. <laughs> Um, mate, if you had a thousand trade business owners in a room, what's one thing you would like to share with them or one piece of advice you'd like to give them? Share with them food. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do That's like to the eat. best answer we've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and piece of advice, it'd just be probably, it'd, mate, talking to your customers is one of the best ways to grow your business. You see where you fall down, you see where you achieve. Mm. Um, and you can get a real roadmap of where you want to be. Yeah. Mm. So it's probably talking to them. Love it. Brilliant, mate. Great advice. And uh, yeah, let's let's rock on around to your place for some food. Uh, uh, I, I don't cook. I've never had to cook since I left home. <laughs> oh, you are very spoiled. <laughs> I know, I know. Very loved. Never but, had to but, start, mate. But I can buy a lot of food, so it's all good. <laughs> 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 mate, um, if listeners want to check you out and stalk you online and creep, uh, what's the best places to do that, man? Uh, mate, if you want to increase our following, what, look at Everscapes Landscaping. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably a good one to see that some of the work. And if you want to look at me personally, uh, at Sensei Adel, S-E-N-S-E-I-O-D-E-L-L. We'll awesome. pop all the links into the show notes so that you can find Adele and Everscape Landscaping. Everscapes, Everscapes. Everscapes with the nest. Sorry, Get sorry, right, sorry. Coxie, it's okay. God, <laughs> Alistair's going to burn me next week. That's all right. <laughs> we're leaders. In, we're leaders in the industry, so you can probably find us anyway. I'm sure yeah, they will. Okay. Ah. <laughs> with your superior video content, content. on, I'm sure yeah, they exactly, find it. exactly. Thank you, Adele. That was just fantastic. Really appreciate um, your openness and willing to share. That was wonderful. Hey, thank you. And thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate you having me. And um, I really enjoy the work you guys are doing, especially around you know, openness and mental health and things with tradies. It really, it really needs to be spoken about a little more. There's less stigma now, but mm. Um, mm. you guys are uh, bringing conversations and really need it. meaningful conversations. Thank you. Well, thanks for being one of the stories we share, mate. Cheers, guys to the Tradies in Business podcast with Warwick Bidwell and Nicole Cox. Find out more about today's guest, tools for your trade business and other cool stuff at tradiesinbusiness.com.au.